So every telescope has got two ends. There's the business end on the front and the party end in the back. And in recent years, we've only really seen innovation to the optics for the front end of a telescope. And there hasn't been much innovation on the back end where the camera and the focuser go. This end of the telescope arguably is equally as important as the front end is. And it's going to affect a lot of your user experience and how good your images are. So let me make a brief comparison to you all. Here is a small little telescope. And in order to focus a telescope, you have to adjust a focuser on the back. Now this focuser is going to slide the camera in and out and put it into the focal plane. But if you were using a modern camera lens, like this 135 millimeter lens, then you can focus this all day and the length of it is not going to change. Everything's going to stay nice and mechanically stable and we don't really need to worry about how much weight we hang off the back because it's all going to be rigid and the moving elements are within the mechanism of the optic itself. Now you can probably see where I'm going with this. <laughs> In astrophotography, the way you have the camera mounted to the back with the focuser is actually incredibly important. Now, especially when you're using big cameras like today's full frame cameras with filter wheels and OAGs, the weight you add to the back of the telescope starts to add up really quickly. And when you stack that onto a draw tube and start to pull it out from the telescope, that weight is going to impact your photos because it's going to apply a moment arm on that draw tube, which is going to cause some tip tilt in your system. Not only this, the further back you pull the camera out of the optics, the worse the vignetting of the system is going to be. So the big question is, why don't we use telescopes like we do camera lenses? Now in truth, there have been some attempts by companies to make telescopes like camera lenses before, specifically the Vixen VSD and the William Optics Red Cat telescopes, which are great telescopes, but they are challenging to use because it's difficult to make them autofocus telescopes. This is because with the helical design, it's difficult to attach a motor. You have to use a belt system and it can be quite difficult to get it set up for autofocus. So the real question is, has anyone made a telescope with a Crayford style focuser that still has the internal focusing element like modern camera lenses do? And the answer is yes, as of now. <laughs> What I got here is the William Optics GT81 WIFD, and this does just that. It operates just like a modern camera lens would, where the back of the camera is rigid, it's stable, or the back of the telescope is rigid and stable, but the actual optical element is with inside the OTA, and it moves by itself. So now you don't ever have to worry about the weight on the back of the telescope because this stays rigid and this comes with some other benefits that we're going to get into for the rest of this review of the William Optics GT81 WIFD. So whenever I review a telescope and I've only reviewed one other telescope there's a couple key factors I like to hit. I like to talk about the optics, I like to talk about the mechanics, the thermal stability, and I think there was one other as well as the uh, the user experience which is very very important. So. Let me talk about the telescope. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cover the uh, the mechanics of it because the mechanics are kind of the main selling point and the most interesting part of the telescope. Uh, mechanically, it's very interesting, of course. It's a, it's a new patented design. It basically works like a modern camera lens does. So internally, there is a mechanism that moves the lenses on the inside to actually move the focal plane onto the imaging chip. So obviously, the main advantage of that is there's no more focus or tilt and you have less vignetting because you're closer up to the optical path. Now, I don't have a very heavy camera to test this with, but if you're just looking at this, this thing has M93 threads on it, so I'm pretty sure I could stand on the end of this draw tube and still be able to shoot through it. I mean, this thing is pretty, pretty beefy. Um, the back end also has a really lovely um, rotator mechanism. I'll give you a, a nice, sexy close-up shot of it but it's just very smooth and it's got a lot of good markings for your pointing angle, which is really, really cool. Now, what else we got here? So the actual focuser itself <laughs> is, is very interesting too. Again, it is internally moving, but it's just like a standard, you know, uh, coarse adjust and then the fine adjust threads on the other side here, which is uh, 
you know, pretty standard. The one thing I, that I find is kind of interesting with the focuser is that they've got, it's hard to see, there's a focuser locking knob like on the bottom of the focuser and I'm kind of confused about what the point of that is because you don't really need it per se. I mean, the thing is with a standard refractor focuser where you're moving the draw tube on the back, the locking mechanism is really important to make sure that your camera doesn't go flying down from the weight of the gravity if you're pointed at Zenith. But in this case, like I could have the telescope straight up and down and I could shake as much as I want, but it's not really gonna move the internal focusing element. So this actual focus locking knob is kind of pointless. And the other problem is you can't reach it at all because it's like buried under the dovetail plate. I could flip it upside down, but uh, yeah, it's just kind of interesting how it is. You would need to run the telescope upside down if you wanted to uh, actually use that focus or locking knob, which if this was a standard refractor would be a complaint, but it's not because you literally don't have to use the focus or locking knob because there is no load on the focuser apart from the lens itself. So that's pretty cool. Um, I like the rings that it came with. It's got nice rings. It's got a nice handle slash uh, guide scope plate on the top, which is pretty handy. So yeah, the, the carrying handle is pretty nice. The lens dew shield is pretty standard. Um, it comes with a thumb screw. I didn't put it on. I mean, it's just kind of, you know, it's pretty uh, snug without the tightening screw. So I don't even know if I'm going to bother putting the tightening screw on, but I mean, mechanically, it's a great telescope. It's a, uh, it's very nice to use. And uh, I never got to put an autofocuser on it because I don't own one, but it is supposedly ZWO uh, EAF compatible. Some of the EAFs struggle under load. I know the EAF, uh, I, I've used the ZWO EAF on some Takahashi scopes and they really struggle with those under load. It's nice that it won't be under load in the situation of this telescope. So thermally, it seemed to perform pretty fine. When I use it for deep sky, I used it out in Death Valley National Park and it was pretty cool. So there, were, there were some pretty big temperature swings and I didn't bother refocusing at all because I only have manual focus, no autofocuser, and it seemed to hold up pretty well over the course of the imaging run, which is great. If we're also talking thermals, the, the telescope also does have a thermometer on one of the knobs. I've never actually used a thermometer on a telescope before manually, but I mean, I guess it could be handy to figure out how cold it is outside. Next, let's just talk about the optics really quick. So this is an 81 millimeter F5.9 refractor. It's a triplet. It's, you know, just your pretty standard tried and true bread and butter 80 millimeter refractor. There's nothing crazy here. It's, it's going to be what you expect. So good optics. Um, nothing to complain about on the optical front. The package I got uh, when I used the telescope came with the 0.8x adjustable reducer, which performed pretty well. I will have to say it's really, really nice to adjust. Uh, this thing is the adjustable reducer. And when I put it on at first, my first time using it, I looked at the corners and I was like, oh my God, the corners are terrible, what's happening? And I just quickly made a couple adjustments by unthreading the reducer. And within like five minutes, I had my reducer completely adjusted and it looked great. So that's not a very common experience I've had before with doing backspacing is being able to adjust it on the fly. So. I really, really, really appreciated that part of the experience optically. Now, the rest of the optics, um, I used it with my full frame Canon 6D when I was shooting with it, and the corners were fine. There was no chromatic aberration, and there was no internal reflection, so I shot one image around Rorofuyuki, and it performed, it performed well. So optically, this telescope is really nice. It's a classic WO GT81 optically. So you'll see many, many great images online on Astrobin with scopes with the identical optics to this one. And you know you're gonna be getting something good with this. The other thing I received in the package along with this telescope since I got the astrophotography bundle was this uh, 30 millimeter guide scope, the little uni guide, which sits at the top of the handles here. And it was nice. I was using this as a, as a travel rig because I brought it out to me during a workshop. So this ended up being a nice, simple solution to use with my, uh, 
my harmonic mount and it worked really well for getting photos. So the last thing I touch on usually is the user experience of the telescope and this is kind of what this telescope is completely optimized for. The focusing was really great. Obviously I don't have to deal with focuser sag. I don't have to deal with the focuser coming loose on the clutches. There's no issues on that front at all. The other nice thing about it, given the, the mechanical elements inside the telescope, is that it balances pretty much over the middle of the telescope. There's no uh, super back heavy classical refractor problems going on here. Something you might see with like some of the smaller 61 millimeter telescopes is that the telescope is so front heavy or back heavy once you put a camera on. Not the case with this. It balances pretty much over the middle. Uh, again, the the adjustable reducer slash field flattener was probably the coolest part of uh, the user experience itself. It's not like you're totally screwed if you don't have the right adapters and you just have terrible corners. No, that, that problem doesn't exist and you can totally adjust it on the fly, which is really cool. And not only the, um, the reducer, but the other thing on the back, the, the fine camera angle rotation adjustment was really, really good. Um, I like all of the fine markings that it has on it. It's just very smooth. You know, it, it has a premium feel to it, which I like. All right, so now that I've talked about just some of the general characteristics of the telescope, let me tell you about the photo I shot with it and how I, how I got the actual image. So I took this telescope out with me to my Death Valley workshop with Derek Culver and Ian Lauer. And on the final night, we got some pretty nice weather. Um, it was pretty iffy though. It actually started raining after we set up, so I had to tear everything down, set everything back up after it stopped raining, and I was able to get to imaging after that. Now, I shot Ro Ofuyuki with this telescope. I also shot Thor's helmet, but I haven't edited that yet. Maybe I'll edit it for this video. But I shot Ro Ofuyuki and Thor's helmet on my HEM27 with a Canon 6D, and I was auto guiding using the Uni Guide on the back. Uh, like I said before, very easy to get to work with the uh, the harmonic mount. And then I spent the whole night until sunrise shooting Ro Ofuyuki. And I ended up getting this photo of Ro with only a couple hours of exposure time, which was really cool. And I'll also show the photo of Thor's helmet if I actually edit it. It's pretty uh, <laughs> it's a pretty small target and I was just kind of looking around for something. So this telescope was able to produce some good images for me. I also shot the moon with it the other night, but yeah, it's it's a great telescope. It has a unique design that's pretty centric on the user experience. The main point that I see in this telescope versus getting another one is the fact that you don't have to pay for an expensive focuser. This is something that I do on pretty much any other refractor I get. Let's say I got like an Orion 80 millimeter refractor or if I got a Skywatcher triplet, the first thing I would do with any such refractor is rip the focuser off and replace it with a different one. And I even do this on every Takahashi I've used. I've tried using Takahashi's with their stock focusers and they're just not good. You're paying for like this expensive multi-thousand dollar instrument, but the focuser is never up to the standard of actually doing full frame imaging with the telescope, which is a lot. So you end up having to pay anywhere from 900 to two grand, maybe even four grand on an aftermarket focuser that can actually deal with a full frame camera on the back for deep sky imaging. Now, this isn't the case with such an instrument. I mean, this, this telescope can handle full frame and you're not going to be spending another one to $4,000 on a focuser on the back just to get it to work like you would on a Takahashi. Instead, you could use something as simple as you know, maybe a little Prima Luce EAF or a little ZWO EAF. Spend maybe like 200 to $300 to make it autofocus and you don't have to worry about replacing the stock focuser. So that's the, that's the role I see this telescope filling is it's a refractor that actually has a good stock focuser, which is pretty rare. That's the cool part about this telescope. But yeah, overall, I would say you can't go wrong with getting a telescope like this, especially if you don't want to deal with paying a bunch of money for a focuser that actually works. And if you're planning on doing full frame imaging with a big 6200mm or a QHY600, then this is a refractor that's actually going to be able to handle it with a filter wheel, all the filters and an OAG. There's not going to be any concerns with actually using a big camera like that on this. I would like to thank Agena Astro for sending me the telescope for this video. You can find this telescope 
on their website. Um, they didn't pay me to make a review for the telescope. They just sent it out. I do have affiliate links for it. So I will get a small commission for taking it out and shooting the photos and putting in the work. So if you're interested in picking up the telescope, head over to Agena and uh, that's where you'll find it. Anyways, I hope uh, you found this review useful, helpful, informative in any kind of way. And I'll uh, catch you guys in the next video.